glad you guys are here today, and uh, thanks for worshiping with us. Hey, I want to start out similar to the way that we did uh, last week and just tell you my name's Mike. For those of you guys who don't know, that's not the important part. What the important part is, is you need to know that I'm a sinner saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, and he's, for the past 39 years of my life, he's been teaching me to walk in the freedom that uh, his blood shed for me, and when he walked out of the grave, he set me free. All to say, as a husband, I know what it is to hurt my wife. As a father, I know what it is to hurt my sons. Uh, I know what, as a man, I know what it is to have a lustful thought. I know what it is to tell a lie. I know what it is to hold a grudge. And the reason I'm telling you all of this is that you too can be set free by Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a slave to sin. You can be set free and walk in, walk in that freedom. That's all for him. And what I would tell you is that you do not have to pretend that you have it all together today. It is okay to tell somebody that you're not okay. It is okay to say, I need you to pray for me because we don't have it all together. Today, if you find yourself sitting on top of a mountain, glory, hallelujah. But if you find yourself just like you're drowning in just a sea and you can't keep on swimming, hey, listen, there's people that would love to absolutely support you. And uh, so make sure that you're just honest and let's let Jesus do what he does, which is the heavy lifting and sets us free. We're in this series that we're calling Seven Letters, where Jesus wrote a letter to the church, seven churches in Asia. And I'm telling you, the words that he said then apply to us just as, as much now as they did to the church back then. And so we've been studying this amazing letter. And if you're here for the first time, I want you to understand the book of Revelation. If you've been coming, I I'm going to say this again so that you can just you can be comfortable with it. You can know what's going on. What you need to know about the book of Revelation is that it was written by one of the original 12 disciples. His name was John. He received this revelation while he was on the island of Patmos. Jesus visited him, gave him a vision, and said, write this down. And so he did write it and went out to the seven churches in Asia. It was written about 95 AD, which is about 60-some years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is about 25 years after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. That's when this letter came out, went out to the church during an intense time of persecution. There's a bad dude named Domitian. He has found himself in control of all of Rome. He is not a good guy. He is not a God-fearing man. In fact, he likes to worship himself. And so he, he puts temples all over Asia where people can come in and they can worship him. And not just like it's optional. It's like, no, you're going to do this. And so being a follower of Jesus who were to have no other, no other gods except for, for God... Uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is a really big deal. And so they, they don't worship Domitian. And because they don't worship Domitian, because they're not Roman, man, they just get in big time. They get their tails in a crack where uh, to follow Jesus literally means you could be in prison. To follow Jesus literally means you won't have a job tomorrow. To follow Jesus literally means you could lose your life for following him. What I would also tell you that you need to know about the book of Revelation is it uses images and it uses symbols that are not real. The images and the symbols are reflective of real circumstances and situations that the church is going through. Last week I showed you some symbols. They may come up on the screen. I showed you the symbol of like the Chevy bow tie. Man, you see Chevy bow tie, you think, wow, that is a good truck. You see the presidential seal, you say, hey, man, we need to be praying for whoever is in government, whoever is leading, we need to pray for them. You see the, uh, the Apple icon, and we, all of a sudden we know that we have, oh, we're talking about a cell phone here, or we're talking about a network provider. All to say, we are just as proficient as they were back then in understanding symbols and images and how it relates to our time. And as John wrote the book, of, these, the book of Revelation, as he wrote these letters and he used images and he used symbols, the church back then was able to plug into them really easy. And we're going to have some symbols and images today that, man, to hopefully bring more sense to the book of Revelation for you. But as we, as we look at this letter, just a couple things that I want to remind us of. First of all, I love what David Platt says about this. He says that the book of Revelation is intended to fuel hopeful obedience amidst trials and temptations in the present. Meaning... It is apocalyptic literature, symbols and imagery, meant to encourage the believers who are being persecuted by Domitian and the Jews in the Roman government. I love what Warren Wearsby says about the book of Revelation, pastor, theologian, commentator. John's prophecy is primarily the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning 
Jesus wins. Love wins. To the church in Revelation that feels like they're losing ground every day, Jesus is reminding them the battle has been won. We've taken all the ground that we need to take. Your job is to be faithful. That's what he's saying. It is primarily the revelation of Jesus. It's not so much about future events. And why that's important is because that's what we like to make the book of Revelation about. But it is primarily about Jesus. And so today, what I want to do is I want to start off where we, be, where we ended last week, which, just, which was with the words of Jesus. And he simply said this at the end of his letter to the church at Smyrna. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says. Today, my job is to communicate the truth about Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Our job together, myself included, is to listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to our lives. Our hope and our prayer is that during the course of this seven-week series, what will happen is that the affirmation and the correction of Jesus, His words, will have a refining influence on our faith. Meaning, as the Holy Spirit speaks, if there is anything in our lives, from our thinking to our actions, that is not of Jesus, that we, had, we would have the boldness and the courage to remove it from our lives. But also... That we would be inspired by the words of Jesus because he's affirming and he provides us great vision and a hope that his words would inspire us to be the type of people, to be the kind of church that he has called us to be in 2020, which is to love like Jesus loved. It's just to pursue God, even if it were to put our lives at risk. That's what we're hoping is going to happen, that we'd be the church of the people that God has created us to do or created us to be. Be. And so that being said, if you wouldn't mind turning in, your, uh, turning in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12, let me tell you a little bit about Pergamum. Pergamum is, these are, uh, these are the words, Pergamum is, we need to know some history, it is a compromising church. It is a church that is wishy-washy, okay? Like there's some compromise going on in the body as a whole, and uh, there's some interesting facts that we need to know to help us understand what Jesus is saying. So one is Pergamum is the largest city in Asia, okay? It's the largest city in Asia, so this is a really big deal. There's a whole lot of industry that takes place here in Pergamum. I think metalwork is kind of their deal. I think that that's kind of like their big claim to fame as far as like industry goes. And uh, if you are a follower of Jesus, what's going to happen is they have trade shows. Trade shows are where jobs are given and received. If you were Roman, you profited from it. If you were Jewish, you profited from it. But if you were a follower of Jesus, you did not profit from it because at these trade shows, these trade guilds, they would have meat. And I'll explain a little bit more about this later. They would bring meat sacrificed to idols. Well, as a follower of Jesus, not supposed to, not allowed to have meat sacrificed to idols. And so they chose not to show up. But in choosing not to show up, they didn't have jobs. They didn't have incomes. It's the largest city. And the Christians here in Pergamum, like Smyr uh, Smyrna, are experiencing a great depth of persecution physically and job related. That's what's going on right there. Now, a little bit more about Pergamum. It is the first place, it's the first city in Asia that they have the very first temple that is built to Caesar. Very first temple ever built to Caesar to honor and to worship their Roman emperor. Where did they build it first? It's a big city. They built it in Pergamum. Okay, so we've got the worship of a of a Roman uh, emperor taking place in this city. It's happening everywhere, all throughout the city. We also have, uh, I think his name is es Escapius. Es there we go. Look at that dude. Greek mythology right here, okay? Es Asculapius. Asculapius is his name. And um, his symbol is the snake. Well, if you look at the snake, doesn't that look familiar? It's a sign for our modern-day medicine. They believed in, in Roman and Greek mythology that this was a god of healing. So for the, for, the Roman folks in, um, for the Roman folks in Pergamum and the Roman folks across the Roman Empire, they actually looked at snakes as a good thing. They were like a sacred animal that possessed wisdom and had life-saving resurrection powers. So Asculapius is the God of healing, and he's got a big temple in Pergamum, and people are coming to worship this thing. 
Now, I think we had a picture of Pergamum up here for just a minute, if we could get that back up there. Here's what I want to say about Pergamum, and here's what, there it is in the, kind of in the middle left of center. Do you see the ruins right there? Do you see, do you see the ruins? Okay, cool. I just want to make sure you guys are with me. You, you just keep that up for a second. This is a really big deal. Last week, I told you the words of Jesus where he said, do not store up for yourselves earthly treasure. He said, store up for yourselves heavenly treasure. Here's what I just want to remind all of us this morning before we get into what's going on in Pergamum. You guys, when you store up, when we store up for ourselves earthly treasure, this is what it's going to look like one day. There was a day and time this place was aesthetically gorgeous. It was a palace that was unparalleled. And look at it now. Meaning, if there's anything in your garage, if there is anything in your home, if there is anything on your wish list that you think you cannot live without, that is what it will one day look like. It doesn't matter how many generations you hand it down to. One day, it will look like this. We would all be wise to heed the words of Jesus. Do not store up for yourselves earthly treasure. Store up for yourselves heavenly treasure. Love people like Jesus. All right, so let's dive in. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Jesus says something to the effect, as I turn there, these are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. Okay, so we've got some amazing imagery and symbol coming out right away. Well, what is it? It's a sword. Why is this a big deal? Jesus wants to let the church in Pergamum know that he is aware the symbol of capital punishment for Rome is a sword. As the, as the Christians look out, they're familiar with the sword because many have met their end by the sword. Rome's got capital punishment, sentenced by death, and they use a sword. Jesus is saying, guess what, guys? I have a sword too. And I overcame Rome when they put me to death. If you're being persecuted, if you find yourself in the wilderness, keep being true to me is what Jesus is saying. Because I have a sword and I will bring death and destruction to all those who do not repent. I mean, here's Jesus being bold. He's just coming out. He's like, if you, listen, if you live apart from me, if Rome refuses to repent, judgment is coming. And so for the persecuted church, they're just like, awesome. We're on the winning side. Well, and there's great authority there, what Jesus is saying. Now Jesus goes, and he goes on verse 13, he says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death, probably by the sword, in your city where Satan lives. Does Satan live in their city? Yeah. Does Satan like have like a throne or whatever? Like, hey, does he have a presence there? Absolutely. How do we know this? Because they have a temple built to Caesar. God says, you shall worship me and worship me alone. But inside the church and for all the people in Pergamum who worship Caesar, Jesus is acknowledging in Pergamum you, this is a city where Satan lives because people are doing the things that Satan would want them to do, which is worship someone other than God the Father. He's saying that about Asclepius. So it's all right there. Satan lives in their city. He's got some thrones there, but guess what? So does Jesus. Jesus is there inside of his believers, and he is going to speak to them. And I absolutely love this. He says, uh, he's going to affirm them. He says, yet you remain true to my name. He says, you're being persecuted, yet you remain true to my name. You guys, amidst all their persecution, what I want you to hear about the church in Pergamum, even though they were missing out on jobs, even though the persecution was at all-time high, they remain true to his name. And if we can just drill down on what it is to be true to his name, is that they cared more about the, the name of Jesus than they cared about their own life. They embraced hardship over conformity to culture. They didn't go along to get along. They didn't try to blend in. 
They said, when I wake up today, I am not guaranteed tomorrow. I am guaranteed today. I am going to do my best to live for the name of Jesus. Which means if I don't go to a trade guild today and I don't get a job today and I get persecuted today for Jesus' name, then glory, hallelujah, he has already cut, overcome. I will overcome with him. Jesus looks at the church and he affirms to them, you have been true to my name. But then he puts some descriptors there. You have been true to my name. He said, you didn't, I mean, it's his words, not mine. You did not renounce me when they killed my faithful servant Antipas. You didn't renounce me. If ever there was a time for fear to overtake the church, it is when they grab this guy that Jesus singles out and they execute him. Everybody knew who Antipas, Antipas was in the church. And they would have been his friends and some would have been family. And if ever there was a moment that they would be gripped by fear, they chose to trust Jesus over fear being true to his name saying, isn't it, saying, if you do to me what you did to him, then so be it. I choose Jesus. I choose life over all of this. And here's what I want to tell you. Here's the, not, not, I, I don't want to tell you. Jesus wants to tell you. Here's what Jesus wants you to know. Anipus and Pergamum are a great reminder that as followers of Jesus, at the end of the day, if you cut it all away, we are to be in the world, but not of it. Pergamum and Antipas in the church and what Jesus Christ affirms about that church is that Highland Park Community Church in 2020, as followers of Jesus Christ, you are to live in the world, but not be of it. Meaning, let's not be swayed by the tide of culture and be swept away with the flood of culture and go along with it. Rather, as the, tent, as the, as the trends and the tide of culture gets more opposed to the things of Jesus, may he anchor us in our daily living. May the presence of his spirit living in us guide us and may it be said of us that when I'm at home and I'm around people in my home that may not believe in Jesus, when, I, when I'm at work and I have to stand up for the things of Jesus rather than just go along with the flow, when I'm out in culture or when from the movies I watch to the things that I entertain myself with, may it be said of us that we were true to Jesus. He sees it. He looks at the heart. He looks at things we don't look at. We can all play a great game. Even some in Pergamum, we're play, we're, they're talking a great game. Jesus looks inside this morning, and there's nothing. We are laid bare before him. We are laid bare before his spirit, man. He, he can see inside and know our affections. He knows our thoughts, and he knows what it really is to be true to the name of Jesus. May it be said of me. May it be said of you. May it be said of us. May it be said of God's holy church around the world that we held true to the name of Jesus. And don't stop praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters because they literally are being persecuted on levels that we aren't. Keep praying for them. As we think about the future, we're going to support them in missions. And so, hey, because that is real, and may they be true. Pray that they would be true to the name of Jesus. So Jesus got a good thing going with the church. He affirms everything, but then he comes in on the backside with a correction, and he says, nevertheless, I do have a few things against you. Verse 14, he says, you, you have people in your church who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. And this thing is loaded right here because as Christians living in that world, they know exactly who Balaam is. You're like, who on earth is Balaam? Well, if you go back to that moment in ancient history where Moses is leading the children of Israel, God has promised them the promised land, okay? And God is leading them into the promised land, and the Moabite kings, they got to go through Moab and Midian, are scared to death that Israel's going to come in and conquer them. 
And so there was a guy named Balaam. Balaam is a Gentile. He's not a Jewish man. He's not a God-fearing man. He is not a God-loving man. He is a sorcerer. He has got connections. Just think about him like like a modern-day psychic who's not kidding and playing around, but actually has ties to the spiritual realm. Balaam had a God-given gift, and he totally misappropriated it. If Balaam blessed you, you were blessed. But if Balaam put a curse on you, he was cursed. So as Balaam, as Balak saw Israel coming into Moab and Midian, he's like, I'm going to go get Balaam to curse God's children. But of course, God wouldn't allow Balaam to curse his children. So Balaam, along with Balak, connived. If he couldn't curse them, he was going to corrupt them. And man, he was shrewd like the enemy. He says, here's what we're going to do. And this is what Balaam told, this is what Balaam told Balak to do. Invite them to your party. Invite them to your party because at your party, you're going to be celebrating your God, Baal. And you're going to have food that was sacrificed to him. Listen, they don't need to go along to get along. But if they just come in and they celebrate just a friendship with you, they are condoning what you're doing and it will corrupt them. And oh, by the way, when the Israelite men come in and they see that Midian and that Moabite hottie, they're going to be like, oh, I have not seen her before. And they're going to desire her. And God told his people going into the promised land, he said, do not intermarry with these people. And here's why. Because men, we love to honor our wives just like they did back then. And he, God knew that if he does his best to honor his wife, well, she loves and worships this God. And you're bringing that into your home, and it's not just going to corrupt. She won't be corrupted. You'll be corrupted. Your kids will be corrupted. Corrupt the whole nation. Idolatry, the slippery slope through sexual immorality. And so God said, don't do that. So the sin, the teaching, when we read that Jesus is coming against the teaching of Balaam, the teaching of Balaam just simply said that you can call yourself a Christian, and still worship idols, and still engage in sexual immorality. That was the teaching of Balaam. That was the teaching of the Nicolaitans in verse 15, is that it is okay to live as unbelievers live. It is Balaam's teaching said, church, it's okay to do what you want to do. It's not a big deal. And there were those in Pergamum who said, wait a minute. You mean I don't have to be faithful to my husband or my wife? I can do what I want to do? And I'm still good with Jesus? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What? I mean, there's guys in there signing up for that. There's ladies in that church signing up for that. It's okay to have idols. Oh, you mean I can, I can love God and still worship this thing over here? Balaam says, yeah, you can. And Jesus is saying... I have this against you, that you think it's okay to be sexually immoral and have idolatry in your midst. And these people thought it was okay. And here's what I want to just remind us. He who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says. What we count as worship, sometimes Jesus looks at and says, no. That is not okay in your life. He loves us so much, church. He will not continue to let us live in sin. He will call it out. What's the big, what is the, what's the big deal with like meat sacrifice to idols? It's not the meat. That's not the meat. Like it's, it's not the meat. It's the fact that that meat was sacrificed to an idol. Like it was brought as an act of worship to someone and something other than God to do for them what only God is supposed to do. That is idolatry. Idolatry is looking for something or someone to meet a need that only God is supposed to meet. Meaning this, today, if you're looking, if you have a hard day and you go home and you look for a bowl of mac and cheese or a plate of biscuits and gravy 
to provide comfort from the day's toils rather than God, and you consistently look for comfort food to comfort you rather than have Jesus comfort you, there's a good chance you have an idol. This could be food. If you cannot remember the last time you didn't have a drink at night to just unwind, it's not a lot, it's just one. But if you look for a drink to help you unwind at the end of the day, rather than asking the Spirit of God to help you unwind at the end of the day, there is a good chance. And listen, there's nothing wrong with food, nothing wrong with an alcohol. Jesus didn't say alcohol is bad. He said getting drunk is. But if you look to that thing to do for you what God is supposed to do for you, there's a good chance you might have an idol in your life. And I could go on and on and on. Listen, we live in Wyoming. We love the outdoors. I love the outdoors. And you put me on a mountain with screaming bulls and things like that, I feel like I am in heaven on earth. Those are not bad things. But the second that I cannot experience the love of God apart from that and being there, it's a good chance I have turned that thing into an idol. And Jesus is saying, none of that. And he also says sexual, sexual immorality is a big no-no. Why is sexual immorality a big no-no? Well, let's just talk about this for a second. Sex is not bad. God made it. You know what that means? It's awesome. It's awesome. Where's that camera? It's awesome. In a God-given context between a husband and a wife. And the thing that made Israel stand out among all the other nations is their sexual purity. They were supposed to be sexually pure, meaning they weren't supposed to attach themselves to this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and their husband. Or that girl, that girl, that girl, that girl, that girl, and his wife. They were supposed to keep the marriage bed pure because get this, church. Physical in intimacy in the form of sex is really reflective of a spiritual moment. Because in that moment where a husband and a wife come together, the two become one flesh. The two become one. In that moment where we surrender our lives to Jesus, Jesus Christ comes into our lives, we die to self, and the two become one. And our bodies, the Spirit of God does not make his dwelling in a building anymore. The Spirit of God has chosen to make His dwelling in our bodies. Our bodies are a temple. And Jesus is saying, for a follower of mine, what God was saying is a, is a child of mine, you shall not unite yourself with a prostitute. You shall not be sexually immoral. But sexually immoral, immorality, it's way bigger than just the sexual act. It can, it can be our thought life. It can be so much more than that. Jesus is just looking at the church and he's saying, this isn't okay. And so this morning, what I want to tell you is, everybody in here, except for maybe that baby that I just kind of heard, has experienced some level of sexual immorality. That is to be human, to have a lustful thought. And there's been moments, maybe in your past, in my past, where I've acted, acted on that sexual thought and or feeling. That is to be human. And the grace of God has forgiven us for this. Jesus isn't talking to the group that had a slip up. He is talking to the group in the church that perpetually lives in sin. This is the big beef against the church in Pergamum, is that they are using the grace of God as an excuse to sin. Because the teaching of Balaam says, Jesus will forgive you. Jesus will forgive you. And so they're like, hey, I'm going to go do this because God's grace is going to forgive me anyway. Hey, I'm going to give in to this desire rather than deny myself like Jesus told me to. Why? Because Jesus is going to forgive me. And so there's a big distinguishing thing between having a sinful moment in our past and continuing in sin. And the thing that I would, that I would just say to us this morning is that if there is an ongoing habit of sexual immorality in our lives, that's a big no-no. If there's a, if there's, it, it's sinful. Jesus is speaking out against it. If there is idolatry in our lives, 
Jesus is speaking out against it. The habit. It had infiltrated the church where a portion of the church was engaged in these things. And Jesus is telling them, I'm going to come against you. Listen to what he says here in verse 16. He says, you are to repent of that. Repent of that. You guys, isn't this good news? If you walk away with nothing else but this, you walk away with the right thing. Even in our sinful condition, you are never so far away from God that you cannot be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. He is love. If you think God is looking to hit you with a hammer, if you think God is some vengeful, hateful, hurtful God, he is not. Because he's talking to the church that is screwing up. He's talking to the compromising church. And I want to say this. Conformity, church, conformity leads to destruction. And he's talking to them, and he's giving them a chance to repent. He's giving them a chance to repent. And so this morning, if your deal's pornography, whatever it is, and you keep doing it, don't do it. And here's what I would say, man, for you young people. If you think, well, it's just oral sex, it's not sex. No, dude, the same deal, man. Same deal. Don't do it. Sinful. Jesus says, repent. He says, repent. Therefore, otherwise, I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Who's them? It's the people in the church who are using grace as a means to continue to sin. That's who Jesus is going to come against. He says, I'm going to bring, here's the imagery of a sword again. Well, it, oftentimes in the Word of God, when we hear sword, we're talking about the Word of God. So Jesus, the Word of God, stands against them, charges them as guilty. And he's telling them, repent, repent from that sin. You can still turn back, you can seek forgiveness, and you can turn back to me. And you can receive forgiveness, but you're supposed to repent. And if you don't, Jesus is saying, I'm coming after you, and my words will judge you. I will judge you. There is a death sentence handed down on that deal, on sexual immorality and idolatry. This is a big deal, church, big deal. And I would just say this morning, those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says. Could any of this be true of your life today? Could any of this be true in my life today? Because Jesus, in his great love, some 2,000 years later, is talking to us today. And he's saying, if it's part of your life, repent. Turn back to me. And this is the best part in the entire letter. Check this out. This is the love of God on display. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come against you, fight against you with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches, to him who overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who's received it. What is Jesus saying? Well, manna. Followers of Jesus knew all about manna. When did God give his children manna? When they were in the wilderness for 40 years. When there was no food source for him. He was the bread of life. And what Jesus is saying is, church in Pergamum, I know what Rome is doing to you. I know the city that Satan lives. If you are faithful to me, I will be your bread of life. I will give you manna. I will sustain you. Even though your life might not feel good, even though the enemy might come against you, I will give you the bread of life. That is a good word for the faithful church. That is a good word for those who would repent and call on the name of Jesus because Pergamum has found themselves in the wilderness and they need manna from heaven and Jesus says, I am that manna. But he's just getting started because that white stone, what does that white stone mean? It's imagery. You see it's imagery and symbols. You see, back in that day, if charges were brought up on you in a legal system and you had to go to court, 
and you were acquitted of the charges that were brought against you, the jury would put a stone in, the, in a container. The judge would put a stone in the container before they handed it to you. And do you want to know the color of that stone? It was white. It was signed for not guilty. It was a sign you were acquitted. What is Jesus telling the church? That if you'll repent, that if you will be true to me, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have all been acquitted of our sins. There is freedom. There is life. You have been given your life back. You guys, that is a message for us today. Man, if you're living in sin, through the blood of Jesus, you can be set free. You can receive a new life, one with free from fear, guilt, and shame, and we would all be wise to live in that. If you're living apart from him today, he invites us into a relationship because his blood and his resurrection has set us free. Be wise, man. Do what wise men do. Pursue Jesus. But that, that white stone had a dual meaning. That white stone back in the day was like a ticket to a really special event. It would have been like somebody last night getting ticket free tickets to the, to the Josh Turner concert. You see, that white stone was like a free ticket to get into a banquet back in the day. Well, Jesus, if you look at his teaching and his imagery, he's always talking about how in his kingdom there's a feast and there's a banquet and that all who come on the name, call on the name of Jesus have been invited to a feast in a banquet. So when Jesus, the first and the last, talks about how you, for those who overcome, you will receive a white stone, you get acquittal, and you get entrance to the, to the feast of all feasts, to the banquet in the kingdom of God, and you're in the buffet is eternal life forever. That is great news for us today. That we are not the sum of our sin. That sin does not have to have the final word. That it can try to label us, but we will not be eternally labeled that because if we are his, we are called his, his children. You guys, this is good news. If this does not get you fired up and ready to go do something in Jesus' name, it needs to. Because he has set us free do not become so comfortable with conformity that might exist in our lives. And I would just again ask for the Spirit to speak. If there's sexual immorality in your life, I'm going to ask a bunch of things right here. If there's sexual immorality in your life and it's a habit, not a one-time event, repent from it. If there's idolatry in your life and it's not an event, but it's a habit, repent so that you can have a life that Jesus found. But I would also say what Jesus would also say to the church this morning is, if you are walking in the victory of Jesus Christ, keep being faithful. Because there will come a day where you will see your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. And he will pick you up as your knees fall to the ground and worship him. And he will look you eyeball to eyeball. And he will speak life into you in this form. Well done, good and faithful servant. You want to live for something, you live for that. Lord, may, we be, may that be true of us that we'd be faithful to you in 2020. And should 2021 or tomorrow come, God help us be faithful there as well. For your name and for your glory. And all the church said, amen. amen. Hey, next week it's going to be awesome. You guys should invite a friend. Jesus got some more great encouragement for us.